Okay. Um, chart says Mars Direct, but in fact, what I'm going to talk about today is not just Mars Direct, but about the colonization of Mars. Uh, but I will also talk about uh, Mars Direct Plan as a key initial uh, stage in that. Okay. I believe that uh, it is fully in our means to have the first humans on Mars within 10 years, uh, and that that can be the beginning of a permanent <coughs> presence, not just a permanent, but an expanding, growing, meaningful, pioneering human presence on our first new world. Now, uh, there are a lot of people out there that, that don't think this is possible. Uh, that they think that humans to Mars is a vision for the 23rd century, and um, you know, and in many cases it will cost you know 400 billion dollars and be far beyond our means. Uh, part of the reason for that is the sort of thing they've seen when they see plans for humans to Mars is the kind of stuff that NASA generated in the 90 Day Report back in 1989. Giant interplanetary spaceships, thousand tons, a hundred meters long. Um, you know, it has to be built on, I, I call this Battlestar Galactica here, okay? Um, it weighs as much as the cumulative payload the United States has launched to orbit since 1975. Um, you know, you got to build it on orbit. You know, with an entire array of orbiting paraphernalia, orbiting hangars, construction docks, power generation stations, cryogenic fuel depots, checkout points crew construction chance, etc. Basically, you know, create a parallel universe on orbit <laughs> within which one can then build Battlestar Galactica spacecraft and sail them off to Mars. Uh, and indeed, this does lend itself to spectacular science fiction artwork, but it does not lend itself readily to get humans to Mars in our uh, lifetime. Um, the, now, as much as many of us are entranced by the vision of the giant interplanetary spaceship, that's not what going to Mars is about. What going to Mars is about is sending a payload from the surface of the Earth to the surface of Mars that is capable of supporting a small group of people and then sending that or an analogous payload back. Okay? So it's not about creating big spaceships, it's about sending packages. Okay? Now, we do need something some way to send the packages. Right now, if you want to send that package, the simplest way to do it, a good old fashioned heavy lift launch vehicle with a good throw stage. Saturn V will do just fine. Okay? Fortunately, the assembly lines that produce the various components that went into Saturn V's are not operating anymore. Uh, although, in principle, you could recreate them, but you really wouldn't want to. Um, there's other ways to do exactly the same thing. We could put together a heavy lift booster with shuttle technology. Not that shuttle technology is anything particularly great or wonderful or anything, but it does work and the parts are available. And there is no secret whatsoever to how one could configure this sort of thing to create a good booster with a good throw stage that could throw payloads to Mars with roughly the same capability as a Saturn V. Um, this is a shuttle-derived vehicle you're looking at here. Um, the hydrogen-oxygen upper stage can throw 47 tons on the direct trajectory to Mars. It could lift 120 tons to Leo. That, by the way, it's slightly less than the Saturn V. Saturn V could lift 140 to Leo. But it's, it, it's essentially the same class. Um, and, and we can have a vehicle like this operating you know, within three years of whenever anyone turned on the money to do so. Uh, and it could launch from the shuttle pads. That's why it has this somewhat silly offset of the engines over here, um, because that's where the flame trenches are on the shuttle pad. Uh, if you were willing to reconfigure the pad, then you just put the engines underneath and you get a little more lift. Um, okay. Well, how does one do this to launch a Mars mission? After all, the Battlestar Galactic spaceship, I showed you, weighed a thousand tons. And it's the booster that can launch that in one piece and blow away Orlando when you took off. Um, <laughs> you could divide 1,000 tons into eight pieces. 1,000 by 120 is eight. Send them out to Mars in convoy, rendezvous along the way. Somehow put the mission together. 
in principle, you can design a mission that way. In fact, I know a guy who once did design a Mars mission that way, but uh, that's a very bad way to design a Mars mission because if you've got eight launches and they're all mission critical and one goes in the drink, you lose the whole mission. Okay. Um, I'm willing to divide the mission up into two chunks and count on two launches both working, but that would still leave you 500 tons of launch. Well, what could you do? Well, perhaps you could invoke advanced propulsion, nuclear propulsion, ion drives, fusion propulsion. Anyone for antimatter? Warp. Warp drive, that's good. How about teleportation? Um, Pixie dust? Is any Peter Pan fans around? <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, now, um, now some of this stuff will work. Nuclear propulsion can be made to work. We had test fan engines in the 1960s. I'll well, get into that a little later. Ion drives, even fusion propulsion, some of the operator. But not within 10 years. And why is that important? 10 years. Why, why is it important to get to Mars in 10 years? At least 10 years from program start, whatever that is. The reason is that the fundamental strategic situation affecting something like a humans to Mars program. The uh, best analogy I could give you is the uh, predicament of the children of Israel in attempting to cross the Red Sea. How, how do I mean? Okay, you're trying to get to the promised land. You can't do it. There's this impassable obstacle in front of you, the Red Sea. No way across. Never going to happen. Then a miracle happens. Moses parts the waters. Bush gives a speech. Humans to Mars. The waters part. Now you've got these two cliffs of water standing there with this path of dry land in between. Now you can cross. But you can't do this on a 30-year timeline, you see, because God's patience is not infinite. I don't know what they say. And, and, you know, the U.S. Congress is a lot worse. Um, <laughs> um, you know, in other words, you try to do this, you know, on a 30-year timeline, you know, the Egyptians are behind you in any case, and besides, you know, DeMille's special effects budget is coming right now, and the water's are going to come together and you're going to drown. In other words, in 1961, John F. Kennedy had said, I want to have humans on the moon by 1990 instead of by 1970, which is what he did say. Then by 1968, when the administration has changed and we're in the Vietnam War, and the national mood is totally different from what it had been in the early 60s. And uh, the space program, perhaps, if it was moving on a slow pace, might have been in the middle of the Mercury one-man capsule flights. People would have said, what the hell is this? Cannabis. They would have canceled the program. And people today would be saying that going to the moon was just this impossible dream of this child president that we had at one time. Never really could have happened, of course. All these sophisticated people know that things can't be done. And, uh, and, and that would be the case. No, if you want to get to Mars, you can't do it in 30 years. You can't do it in 20 years. If you want to get to Mars, you've got to do it in 10 years or less, or you're guaranteeing that the waters are going to come together on you. So as admiral as advanced propulsion might be, it's not going to be the way we're going to get to Mars the first time. Okay? Because if you try, you'll stretch things out so long you'll make the program fail. Advanced propulsion will come later. Okay? Uh, so what's the alternative? The alternative is approach Mars in the same way people have approached exploring and pioneering environments on Earth, which is don't bring everything you need with you. Live off the land. Reduce the mass you have to send to Mars by making use of the mass that's already there. Because it is, in fact, the resources of Mars that make it interesting, okay, both scientifically and as a possible destination for colonization. And it's those very same resources that make it attainable if you use them. So how does this work in practice? Well, you can launch to Mars every other year. So I just call it year one, year three, year five. Right now, year one could be 2005. Year three could be 2007. Year five could be 2009. 2005, we launch one of those boosters off the Cape. We use its upper stage to throw to Mars an unmanned payload weighing around 40 tons. Flies out to Mars on a minimum energy trajectory, gets to Mars in eight months, uses an aero shell to capture into Mars orbit. It's called aero braking. And then you bring it down on Mars, land it with a parachute and retro rockets, just like we did with the Viking mission in 1976. Now you got something landed on Mars. And by the way, as I said, this is an unmanned and unwomaned payload. No one is in it at all. Uh, however, um, there it is. 
what is it? It's the Earth return vehicle. Okay, it's got a little cabin, Spartan quarters for crew of four for a six-month voyage from Mars back to Earth during the final phase of the missions. Two methane chemical propulsion stages, methane oxygen rocket engines, chemical rockets, uh, which, however, are unfueled. They got to be unfueled with this thing. Would be much too heavy for anything like a Saturn V-class vehicle like the Ares to throw into Mars. However, in some of the lower stage tanks that are later going to contain methane, we have around six tons of liquid hydrogen, probably in gel form. And then slung below the vehicle, not shown in this picture, we got a little light truck, like a little pickup truck that runs on a methane oxygen internal combustion engine. And sitting in the back of the truck, we got a little nuclear reactor with power of around 100 kilowatts. Okay? So after you land, you telerobotically drive the truck, few hundred yards away from the landing site, unwinding the cable off the back of it as you go. Okay, then when you get a certain distance away, you lower the reactor off the truck, put it on the ground, preferably it's a little crater or a ditch or on the reverse side of the hill, anything to put a nice sized chunk of dirt between the reactor and the main landing area. When you turn it on, now you got power of the ship. What are you doing? Well, we go hunt ourselves some marsh and buy some of them. Otherwise known as carbon dioxide molecules. There's vast herds of it on Mars. Mar Mar Mars has got an atmosphere. It's 95% it's CO2. You run a pump, you suck it in. The CO2 okay, reacts with these six tons of hydrogen that you draw from Earth okay, in the lower stage tanks. Um, CO2 will react with hydrogen to produce methane and water. Methane is natural gas. It's great rocket fuel. You store that in your tank. The water you split with hydrogen and oxygen. Water electrolysis. Store the oxygen, recycle the hydrogen, do it again. Okay? You run a third again. Okay, that'll take your six tons of uh, hydrogen and turn it into 72 tons of methane oxygen. You can make additional oxygen by taking CO2 and splitting it into carbon monoxide and oxygen. Store the oxygen, vent the CO2 as waste. You can do that on Mars. There's no EPA there. <laughs> Is, is take your six tons of hydrogen from Earth and turn it into 108 tons of methane oxygen on the surface of Mars. It's a leverage of 18 to 1. Okay? And that's what makes the whole mission sing. It's, it's like a pioneer being able to acquire the useful mass of a, of a bison for the transported mass of several bullets and cartridges. Okay? And because of that, we make extra propellant beyond what the Earth return vehicle needs. We make 12 tons of extra propellant, which we use to support the operation on Mars of ground vehicles running on combustion engines. And there's a real advantage to that because combustion engines got a much higher power to mass ratio than you can get with electric vehicles driven by batteries and fuel cells or RTGs. And that, I mean, that's why they're so much more popular here on Earth. That's why we like to use them, despite various other disadvantages. Uh, in a frontier environment like Mars, where you really do need long range and speed and hauling capability and torque and all the muscle that you get from a combustion powered car, well, you definitely want to use it, but it's not practical to use it. Uh, if you had to bring the fuel from Earth. But since we can make it on Mars, we can. And that's key, too, because we're not going to Mars, you know, just to say we did it. We're not going to Mars to plant a flag. We're not going to Mars, you know, to set a new altitude record for the Aviation Almanac. Okay. The, uh, we are going to Mars to explore a planet, and the key thing you need to, to explore a planet is mobility on the surface. And if you're going to have mobility, you've got to be able to make your fuel there. And so, indeed, we can. Now, a lot of times it's pretty easy to write chemical equations on a chart and say you can do it, and another thing entirely to actually do it. That's not the case here. I can vouch for that when I was at Martin Marietta. We built a machine that does the chemical synthesis that I just showed you. Here it is. It's a full-scale unit. It really worked. It was 94% efficient. It cost 47000 bucks. Now, I, I know that you know in the world that in which all of us actually live, $47,000 can buy substantial things, okay? But at a major aerospace company, $47,000 is zippo. It is nothing. Okay, this is the cheapest thing that has ever been built at Martin Marietta. And, <laughs> and, and, and it worked just fine, despite the fact that nobody on this project, not me, not Larry Clark, the other engineer shown over there, was actually a real chemical engineer. We're just aerospace engineers sticking around to prove to NASA that wheels will roll. This is a very simple chemical, <laughs> chemical synthesis operation. It's 19th century chemical engineering. Um, so far from being a magic trick, pulling rocket fuel out of the air, this is in fact vastly simpler than doing something like building a launch vehicle or navigating across interplanetary space or performing a soft landing on another planet. Uh, this is the only part of a human Mars mission that you can do at home. Um, <laughs> complete instructions are in my book. Um, <laughs> all right, so, what happens now? Um, okay, it took eight months to 
fly to Mars. It took 10 months to make the propellant. That's 18 months. There's 26 months between launch windows from Earth to Mars. So long before the next launch window has opened up, we will know we have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for us on the Martian surface. That being the case, at the next launch window, 2007, October 2007, okay, we can launch two more boosters off the Cape. One shoots out another one of these Earth return vehicle fuel factory deals, the other shoots out a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in it. Now, because their return ride is waiting for them on the surface of Mars, all fueled up. They do not have to fly to Mars in the giant, impossible Galactica Battlestar spaceship. No, they can fly to Mars in something much simpler. For example, a tuna can. Um, <laughs> that's good, we, because we have a much better idea of how to build tuna cans than Battlestar Galactica's. Now, uh, and they've been proven in commerce to be a real effective shape for volumetric packaging purposes. Uh, now this one is a little bigger than the standard chicken of the sea model. It's 27 feet in diameter and 16 feet tall. So you got two decks each with uh, eight feet of headroom. Upper deck's habitation, the lower deck is the cargo hold and, and garage workshop kind of place. You should observe I'm doing this pitch one handed. Uh, uh, all right, this is the upper deck of the cab. Um, uh, little stateroom for each of the four astronauts, a science lab, an exercise area, a galley. In the center, you have a solar flare storm shelter, okay, uh, which is shielded, not with lead or something useless, it's shielded with food and water and things that food and water become as the mission proceeds. Um, and you got, got a lot of that on board the ship, you got enough to pack it in around the pantry to shield against solar flares. So you can shield against solar flares. It only takes five inches of water or its equivalent in things like food and waste to shield out solar flares. You can create a shelter. It's kind of small. You're crammed in there for a few hours when the flare happens. You're only going to get one or two big flares in the whole mission at most. Okay, so it's just like riding the A train in New York City, which I had to do when I was teaching school there, except you don't have panhandlers coming through. If you do, then you got another problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, um, and that's true. And the other thing, by the way, you'll notice about the half here is you've got uh, um, furniture on the floor. You've got chairs and shelves in the sink. This thing's designed for use in a gravity environment. Okay? We can make gravity in space. Okay? By tethering off the burnt out upper stage, the booster that flew us to, threw us to Mars, that's coasting to Mars too. Tether off of it, spin up with a non electrodynamic tether so you don't have to worry about it melting itself. And you create Mars normal gravity in the ship. That's good. That way you don't have the um, long duration health effects of, of long duration exposure to zero G that we saw among the Russian cosmonauts who went on to the Mir and its predecessor space stations in the 1980s and 90s, where they all came off in terrible shape, had to fall off in stretches, stretchers after six months in space. So that's why we designed the Mars Direct Mission this way. However, it is useful to point out that we do have a new data point here. Okay, people may remember this photograph. Okay, this is a Newsweek in October 1996. This is Shannon Lucid. She's an American astronaut. She flew on the Mir for six months, which is as long as it takes to fly from Earth to Mars. Okay, and when she landed on the shuttle, she walked off the shuttle. Okay, she wasn't hauled off on a stretcher. And then this picture was taken one day later. She's walking around Johnson Space Center. Okay, you know, it's hot, it's humid. She's taking hands with Bill Clinton, and she is still not sick. Now, <laughs> not possibly pull this off. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, the reason is that Shannon actually implemented the exercise program that had been designed by the flight surgeons at JSC, which involved two hours of rigorous exercises every day. And in consequence, when she landed, she was in better athletic condition than when she took off, because she had never exercised like that in her life. Okay, and the, uh, 
The reason why the cosmonauts came down as bowls of jello is they did not do the exercises. The cosmonauts are undisciplined. They do not do the exercises. In fact, they drink a lot on orbit. <laughs> and, the, uh, okay? and which you know may be suggestive of what actually happened last year. The uh, <laughs> So if you have people as disciplined as Shannon Lucid, it turns out you really can do six months in zero G. Okay, it's the old story, iron men and wooden ships, or rather iron women in this case, and wooden ships. But as Shannon herself pointed out in her article in Scientific American last month, uh, the exercises were a real drag, and so uh, I still prefer the artificial G approach. But she did prove that if you had the right people, you could do it zero G. Okay? So, uh, all right, take six months to fly to Mars. They get to Mars, they fire the pyro bolt, cuts the cord, upper stage goes bye bye into heliocentric space. They go, they arrow break into Mars orbit. Okay, and then they go and they land at site number one where the fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for them. Okay, we've explored the area with local robotic rovers for the past two years. We've got a beacon on the ground to draw them in. We've got an ace fly on this thing. We should be able to hit this thing right on the spot. But even if we don't, let's say we land 20, 30 miles away, we're, we're still okay. We have with us, a, a in the lower deck of the half, a pressurized ground roving vehicle about the size of a 4x4 four four with a, 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 a one-way range of 600 miles. It runs on a methane oxygen internal combustion engine. It would really take piss-poor piloting to land outside the radius of action of that view. But, but let's say you did. Let's say you, know, you landed on the wrong side of the planet, okay? This, by the way, would represent a, a very serious problem with the pilot selection process in JFC. <laughs> uh, um, if, if that were to occur, you're still okay. You've got the second Earth return vehicle following out to Mars. And if you did land on the wrong side of the planet, you could bring that one down to land near you wherever you did land, and that would be done accurately because it would be automated. Now, the, uh, <laughs> now, you know, okay. And then finally, as a fourth level backup, and even that failed, you, you know, your, your fourth level backup is you got the whole crew landed on Mars. Okay, where they got natural gravity, where they got substantial radiation protection offered by the Martian environment, they got enough supplies with them to last for three years. So that if worse comes to worse, they just tough it out on the surface of Mars until the next launch window opens up in 2009, okay, and more supplies and another Earth return vehicle will be fired out to them at that time. Okay, by the way, did I mention the landing occurs in April 2008, okay, which is worth pointing out to the President elect uh, in 2000 because it would be within his or her second term if they chose to be intelligent enough to do this. Uh, now, um, anyway, okay, but you know, what if we don't need the second Earth return vehicle to back us up? Well, we use it we to land us somewhere else, site number two, probably a few hundred miles away. Why? Because we want it to be a new place because that'll be explored next, but I'd like it to be within at least one way driving range of my first landing site so that the crew has available to them two complete Earth return vehicles, either one of which can get them home. And they have available to them three complete habitation volumes that can support them, the big one in the hair module and the two secondary ones in the Earth return vehicle cabins. Okay. But of course, the main purpose of the second Earth return vehicle is to land somewhere else where it starts making propellant that it uses to support the next mission flying out there in 2009, which flies out with another ERV, which is their backup, but which otherwise opens up site number three. So the idea here is that every two years you're launching two boosters off the Cape. One to open up a new site, one to exploit the previous site. Two boosters every two years is an average of one per year to support a continuous program of human exploration of Mars. Right now we launch at least six shuttles a year. Okay, that's our minimum rate. Okay, uh, this would say that we're using 16% of our available heavy lift capability to open up a new world. It is something that this country can easily afford to do. And I might add that, you know, uh, given that we do have a space program, I think it is entirely reasonable that it does use at least 16% of its capability to actually explore space. Um, and uh, so it's something we ought to do. So. This, uh, this is an actual photograph of the Mars base. <laughs> um, here's the Earth return vehicle, okay, the cabin, the two chemical propulsion stages, the synthesis plant, and the landing stage, which acts as the takeoff pad of the rest of it. 
Here's the reactor in the crater in the background. Here's the HAB module. The upper deck is living space. Lower deck is the garage. Here's some photovoltaics they bring with them to act as backup power in case we turn the reactor off. Uh, here's an inflatable greenhouse, non-mission critical element with learning how to grow crops on Mars and Martian soils. A few words about that later. Um, and here's the uh, pressurized ground rover about the size of a 4x4 four four for 10-day uh, excursions into the field to do field exploration. And the backup vehicle is, is the light truck uh, that was used to deploy the reactor. It's non-pressurized, but it can be used as a rescue vehicle for the two people who are out in the field and the crew with the pressurized rover. Um, Okay. They're going to be on Mars 500 days. And they're going to be on Mars 500 days, and they're going to try to explore Mars okay, to find out the answers to two fundamental sets of questions. Okay. The first set of questions is um, revolved around the fundamental issues of was there, is there a life on Mars? Okay. You know, uh, everybody here, you know, unless you yourselves happen to have been on Mars yourself in August 1996, heard about the Martian meteorite with all the evidence that is suggestive of life on Mars in the distant past that was contained in that rock. Now, that's not conclusive, it's controversial. I, I personally am inclined to, to view it as fairly strong. However, long before that rock uh, was brought to light, uh, we had plenty of other evidence making Mars a prime suspect for life. Here's Viking photographs of, of, of Mars. You can see dry riverbeds all over the place on the surface of Mars, and Pathfinder landed in a runoff channel. We found rounded cobbles formed by water erosion without any doubt whatsoever. Mars was warm and wet for a longer period of time than it took life to appear in the fossil record on Earth. And that's real important, because what's that, that mean? That means that if the theory is correct that life is a natural evolution where you ever have appropriate physical and chemical conditions for a sufficient period of time, uh, then life should have appeared on Mars, even if it subsequently went extinct when the climate deteriorated. And if we can go to Mars to find fossils, we will have proven that. And then what we'll have proven by doing that is not just, well, gee, Mars once had bacteria. Isn't that an interesting you know, footnote in the history of science? Uh, no. What you will have proven is that the processes that lead to life's development are non-exceptional. And since we now know that solar systems are general, okay, because we've discovered nine, Outside, we discovered nine extrasolar planets, okay, which once again does not prove simply that there are nine extrasolar planets. What it proves is that the theories of planetary formation that involve exceptional, unprobable accidents like colliding stars and so forth are false, and that planetary formation is a necessary uh, organic um, uh, development coincidence with the development of stars themselves means planets are everywhere, it means life's everywhere, and since what we see on Earth is a continuous process of increased complexification of life, of, of development, to ever more complex forms capable of more degrees of activity and intelligence, uh, it means that intelligent life is everywhere in the universe. It means we're not alone, it means we've got company, it's worth finding out. Okay? You're not going to do it with robotic rovers. Okay? Robotic rovers are cool, and if they're all you can do, well, that's fine, but the, I mean, you know, think about the sojourn, little sojourn. Nice little thing, nice toy car. It had wheels six inches in diameter, okay? It could move six feet a day, okay? It could not climb over rocks one foot tall, okay? It had no manipulative abilities whatsoever. Its eyes were eight inches off the ground, okay? You know, if, if you put it in a fossil dig on Earth, they use it to put coffee cups on. <laughs> the, uh, okay? You know, I, I live in Colorado, Rocky Mountains. It's dinosaur heaven, okay? I guarantee you that if you parachuted a thousand sojourners into the Rocky Mountains, you would not find a single dinosaur fossil. Okay? Not in the next year, next hundred years, next thousand years, not until the next ice age came along and your army of sojourners was crushed by the advancing glaciers which they could not outrun. The, uh, <laughs> no, if, 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 if you, you know, want to do fossil hunting, you've got to have real live human rock hounds on the scene. Okay? The, uh, so we're going to be on Mars. As I said, a year and a half. We do all this exploration at the end of the year and a half. We get in the Earth return vehicle, put the key into ignition, start her up, shoot home direct to Earth. We don't have to rendezvous with any mothership in Mars orbit. There is no mothership in Mars orbit. We don't have to rendezvous with the space station. You could, but the Pacific Ocean's a bigger target. So you just <laughs> fly into the atmosphere, pop a chute, get picked up by the boat. You leave behind you on Mars all the rest of this stuff. The HAB module, the reactor, the greenhouse, the car, the solar panels, the truck, all this. 
Is this bad? We're leaving all this stuff behind. Don't we want to reuse everything, you know, like the reusable launch vehicles? No. You don't want to bring the stuff back from Mars, okay? Because we have a lot of stuff right here, right now, as it is. The, the idea of, of Mars missions is to bring as much stuff to Mars as you possibly can and come back with as little as you can, because everything you leave behind on Mars um, is left behind on Mars for use by future missions. So here's the situation that might develop after uh, eight missions have occurred. The landings are in the centers of the circles. By the way, you can see here from this map that Mars is considerably larger than, than Texas. Okay? Uh, and um, and uh, uh, some people sometimes ask me, looking at this chart, you know, does this mean that by the seventh mission you'll have relocated Texas to Mars? And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it works in a lot of other places. Uh, uh, unfortunately, no, that would be an exaggerated claim. However, uh, um, but you can see these circles have a radius of 300 miles, which is the sorting range of the ground vehicle. And so you can see that each mission is exploring a pretty sizable area about the size of Texas. Okay? And you're, you can drive from one to the other because the one-way distance between landing sites um, are um, within the capability of the rover. Uh, and, but however, after a number of these missions have occurred, and I, it might be eight, it might be four, it might be twelve, okay, the fundamental question on Mars is going to shift, because we're going to get the answer to this one of whether there was ever life on Mars. And we'll have a fairly good idea of about how far it managed to develop itself and how it complexified itself. We'll learn a lot from that. At which point, the fundamental question on Mars is going to shift. From the question number one, was there is a life on Mars, to the second question, which is vastly more important in the long run. And that, that question is, will there be life on Mars? Okay, because the most important fact about Mars is that Mars is not simply an object of scientific inquiry. It is that. It's an enormously important object of scientific inquiry. But it's much more than that. Okay, it is a world. It is a planet that has a surface area equal to all the continents of Earth put together, that has on it all the resources needed to support not only life, but a new branch of human civilization. And it is unique in the solar system in that respect. Okay? In that Mars has on it, well, it's got water, not just a little water here and there in a half of 1% concentrations, which, by the way, is drier than concrete. Okay? Uh, it's got lots of water. It's got oceans of water frozen into the soil as permafrost and as ice. Okay? In fact, there is so much water on Mars that if Mars was smoothed out and the water was melted out of the soil, you'd have enough water on Mars to put the entire planet under an ocean 600 feet deep. That's how wet Mars is. Okay? Now that's dry compared to the Earth. Okay? If the Earth was smoothed over, we'd be under 6,000 feet of water because we are, in fact, a water planet. Okay? But it is about the same as the Earth would be is if you got rid of the salt water oceans and just had the fresh water reserves that the Earth has, which is more than enough to support uh, a thriving ecosystem and civilization on Earth. Okay? The, uh, that's how wet Mars is. And it's got carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and also probably carbonate rocks as well. Undoubtedly carbonate rocks since we found some in the Allen Hills meteorite, in fact. Uh, and the uh, Okay, and it's got nitrogen. It's the minority constituent of the atmosphere. There's no carbon on the moon, for example. There's no nitrogen on the moon to speak of. Okay? You know, I mean, you've got to realize how important these things are. Carbon is the basis of organic chemistry, which is the basis of life. It's the basis of clothing, fabrics, most fuels. Okay? This is extremely valuable stuff. It's absent from the moon. On the moon, shit would be more valuable than gold. Okay? The, uh, you've got to realize that if you're viewing these things in terms of the potential for supporting colonization. And Mars has got a 24-hour day. That's very important. That's what plants want. That has the right cycle of light and dark for natural plant growth in natural light. And the sunlight on Mars at the equator is the same as that on Norway on Earth, which is more than enough to grow abundant plants. Okay? The, uh, and, in, and you have an atmosphere, which as thin as it is, is thick enough to mask out solar flares. Okay? from being uh, biologically dangerous to plants. So you can actually grow plants on the surface of Mars in thin-walled, inflatable greenhouses lit by natural sunlight. You can't do that on the moon because the resources to make the plants are absent from the moon because the day-night cycle is wrong and because there is no atmosphere to shield out solar flares. 
Okay? If you wanted to grow plants on the moon, you'd have to do it with imported material. You'd have to do it underground and heavily shielded things. So you'd have to do it in things powered by electrically generated light, which is incredibly formidable. Because what you, you have to understand is that plants are enormous consumers of light energy. Okay? You've got to realize that. The, the, you know, it's, it, it's a gigawatt per square kilometer. It's the Rhode Island, okay, which is about 1,000 square miles. Okay? uses as much light energy as would be generated by all the electric plants on Earth today combined. Okay? That agricultural giant, the breadbasket of the world, Rhode Island. Okay? <laughs> the, uh, okay? that, that, that's how hard it is. On Mars, we can actually do agriculture. Furthermore, Mars has had a complex geologic history with volcanism, with hydrologic action, probably even biologic action, Exactly the processes need to create mineral ore to concentrate geochemically rare minerals like, or, or, or elements like copper, which is essentially absent from the moon, is, is present on Mars in the form of copper sulfate ore, just as it is on Earth. Uh, in other words, Mars has got the elements of life and it's got the elements of industry as well. And if we can go to Mars and establish a permanent base on Mars, we can make Mars habitable. Now what do I mean by we can make Mars habitable? Do I mean that we can terraform Mars? Well, ultimately, I believe absolutely that humanity will terraform Mars because it is the nature of life to take barren environments and transform them into those that can support life. That is the entire history of life on Earth. And far from, you know, you know there are certain people right now who call themselves environmentalists say, how dare you think of terraforming Mars? Doesn't Mars have the right to be a dead rock? And the, uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, you know, without your hubristic, horrible, offensive, dominion over nature, you know, mentality coming into things here. Uh, no, uh, it would be unnatural for humans not to terraform Mars. It would be unlifelike. It would be turning our back on our entire biological heritage. Okay? There was no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere until plants put it there. There was no soil on land until pioneering plants and animals created it there. You know, uh, a year ago, I had this experience. I was hiking in Colorado, where I live, and I was sitting on the top of one of the smaller mountains, just above tree line, in fact. I'm sitting there eating my lunch, and I just start thinking, how did these trees get up here? How did these trees get up the mountain? And then I see these chipmunks running around carrying pine cones. And I realized the chipmunks actually transported the pine cones up the mountain. And by so doing, they extended their habitat. They terraform their environment in order to expand it. Okay? Now, you know, we need to be at least as good as them. Uh, and in fact, well, but no, it's important, okay? Because they didn't just expand their own environment, they expanded the environment of a whole set of, of plants and secondary animals and insects and bacteria and everything that rely upon that habitat. Well, similarly, human beings are the mechanism that nature terrestrial nature, Gaia, if you will, has evolved to allow it to itself to transport itself across interplanetary distances. And it would be a betrayal of billions of years of biological evolution and trillions upon trillions of critters that have lived and died in order to evolve the biosphere to this stage to where there is finally a species that can, boom, take it to another world um, the, uh, for us not to do it. But that said, we're not going to terraform Mars. The people in this room, the people alive today, are not going to terraform Mars. That is beyond our time. However, we nevertheless can make Mars habitable. What do I mean by that? By transforming it intellectually. Because the thing that determines whether an environment is habitable or not is only partially up to the objective conditions of the environment itself. It is largely up to you. It's up to what you got up here. What do I mean by that? Two people can be stranded in the woods, and one can starve to death in three weeks, and the other can live there indefinitely in relative comfort. Why? Because to one, the resources of the woods are invisible, and to the other, they are apparent and knows how to use them. Okay, similarly, if we can go to Mars and learn how to take these materials that do exist on Mars, okay, and use them to learn how to... Uh, go beyond the Mars direct phase of making fuel and oxygen out of the atmosphere to growing food on Mars, okay, in, in native soils, uh, the, to learn how to extract water from the soil, or better yet, geothermally heated water from the subsurface, okay, to generate both water and power, 
Okay, the uh, to learn how to make bricks on Mars and glasses and plastics and ceramics and metals and wires and tubes and how tanks. If by creating that that we can establish a base on Mars and create that body of knowledge to allow human beings to become self-sufficient on Mars, and at that point Mars becomes habitable. Okay. Just mention a briefly a few things. Okay. Well, there's all sorts of chemical processes that one can do to make fuels on Mars. Uh, the, uh, and most of these have now been done in the lab in compact units like the one I did at Martin and some we've done more recently at Pioneer. Okay, you got lots of iron on Mars in the form of Fe2O3, which is hematite. That's what you make iron out of. Okay, that's why the planet's red. Okay, uh, it's easy to reduce with especially carbon monoxide. Uh, which you can make on Mars as a byproduct of your fuel making processes, or hydrogen, which you can get from the water. Okay, if you've got carbon, you can reduce alumina to aluminum. See, this is another point you've got to realize. There's plenty of, of alumina on the moon, for example, uh, and there's iron, although not in the form of hematite, but in the form of FeO, which is harder to reduce, but in principle you could still reduce that. However, you don't have the carbon that's needed to reduce it. Similarly, silicon. Okay, tons of silicon on the moon, and there's tons of silicon on Mars, and they're both in the same form in this case, Si2, SiO2. But you need carbon to reduce silicon, uh, and it's widely available on Mars, and it'd have to be imported to the moon. Okay, if you can make silicon, you can make solar panels, and you can also make silane, which will actually burn in CO2. Silane is a fuel that will combust in CO2, so you actually have uh, air, an oxidizer, that will burn this fuel, which is a very good thing for vehicles. The uh, geothermal resources are available on Mars, okay, which is something completely absent from every other, well, I mean, the moons of Jupiter uh, have geothermal power probably, but uh, certainly the moon and asteroids do not. Uh, the, uh, that is, if you um, uh, look at Mars, uh, you can estimate the time since they have been volcanically active of various sections of Mars. Okay, and for instance, uh, there's a certain fragment of Mars that's been volcanically active in the past five million years, which is to say basically now, because that's the present, geologically speaking. Okay, and uh, uh, probably 50,000 square kilometers of Mars fall into that category. Uh, and that is stuff that can be tapped for geothermal power. A lot of people don't know, geothermal power is the number four source of power on Earth after combustion, hydroelectric, and nuclear, next is geothermal. It is orders and orders of magnitude cheaper and more widely used than solar or wind power. Okay? Um, and uh, it is potentially available on Mars. Okay? I've been down in the moon because it's not a good place for settlement, but the moon is a good place to do astronomy, to learn about the universe from, and it is Useful simply to point out that the same hardware we use to pioneer Mars, we can use to establish lunar bases as well. So that, I mean, just viewing this programmatically, you'd want to attain both destinations with the same hardware. Um, with a common set of hardware, you can establish human bases on both of the Moon and Mars. Lunar ones for astronomy and science, and the Mars ones as footholds for colonization. Now I'm talking about colonization, okay? Now, first people that go to Mars will go with chemical propulsion because we've got it, and we don't want to wait till we have something better to go. But there is stuff that's better. It really just speaks to the stagnation of our space program that we don't have anything better right now. And the reason why we don't have anything better right now is because the Mars program that was to follow Apollo was canceled in the early 1970s, and so was the nuclear propulsion program that was being developed side by side with it. Nerva engines okay, were tested in the 1960s. On the test stand, they worked. They weren't yet flight rated, but there's absolutely no doubt that these can be made to work. This is 1968 you're looking at here. Okay? Uh, 60,000 pounds nuclear uh, thermal rocket engine with a specific impulse twice that of the best chemical engine that's ever lived. Uh, it worked. Okay? Now, once you have people on Mars, there will be the driver to create such more advanced forms of propulsion. Because this is very important to understand. Transportation follows destination, not the reverse. 
Columbus crossed the Atlantic in ships that were developed from the Mediterranean. Okay, because no one had any reason whatsoever to design Atlantic capable ships until there was a transatlantic civilization to use them. So he crossed the Atlantic in ships that even 50 years later no one would have dreamed of crossing the Atlantic in. Okay? But he did it. And once he found some place to go on the other side of the ocean, naval architecture advanced rapidly. The three master caravels and later on clipper ships and steamships and ocean liners and Boeing 747s. If he had waited for a 747, he would have waited a real long time. The, uh, even longer than you think he would have waited because they wouldn't have been in uh, America for the Wright brothers to live in in order to invent an airplane. Uh, okay. Now, however, once you have colonies developing on Mars, there will be the need for development of more advanced forms of propulsion to both increase payloads and reduce transit times. The number one, initial one on the list, that would come to being, in my view, because it is so straightforward, is the nuclear thermal propulsion. If you had nuclear thermal propulsion, all you would need to do is add a nuclear thermal third stage to an RE's, and you could send 100 tons trans Mars on the same launch vehicle, and send big four-deck hab modules like this, sufficient to house 25 people on a one-way trip from Earth to Mars, okay, and provide housing for them once they get there. If we had a situation where we had the ability to be self-sufficient on Mars so that every person on Mars is not a liability in terms of logistics but is actually can produce what is needed to support themselves, then we can emigrate to Mars in large numbers. If we simply launch four of these things a year, or rather eight every other year, which frankly would be entirely within the means of the United States all by itself, okay, let alone in concert with other nations, okay, this is the kind of population growth curve you get. Okay? If you started this in 2010, which perhaps is a bit optimistic, but you can just shift out the basic date 10 years if you like. Uh, you know, by uh, 2030, by 20 years later, you'd have 4,000 people on Mars. Okay? By 2070, you'd have 25,000 people on Mars. And you'll notice that of them, uh, around 3,000 of them are under 19 years old. They are native-born Martian children. The, um, and if you were to compare this population growth curve to what actually occurred in colonial America uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, what you see is actually it is slightly less than what we had here. But in terms of basically where everything's going, it's pretty much the same story. Okay, that this, that with even this crude advance over current heavy lift boosters and 1960s generation NTR technology, we can populate Mars at a rate comparable to that which North America was colonized. Okay, and do it really uh, as a trivial part of, of the national budget or even a modest part of, of NASA's budget. Uh, now, however. That is enough to build up a substantial initial colony. But if we want to have the energy of a truly vibrant civilization, we want to have a situation where not merely governments can send selected teams to Mars and, uh, or, or other relatively restricted categories of people, but where individuals can go to Mars, where they can make the same individual decision to emigrate to Mars that uh, millions of people have uh, over time. Uh, to America and, and add that kind of creativity and immigrant drive that uh, we welcome in this country up till almost today. Uh, the, uh, well, in order for that to occur, in order to have wide open immigration to Mars, we do need to cheapen the cost of, of, of space launch. See, we don't need to cheapen the cost of space launch to send our first crews to Mars. We do not need to cheapen the cost of space launch in order to establish the first human bases on Mars and even very large uh, initial colonies on Mars. Okay? It's just not true. We don't need to wait for you know, $100 a pound to orbit for that any more than we have to wait for ion drives to do it. However, if we do want to open up Mars wide, for full-scale colonization, we do. Uh, now, in fact, what are the ultimate limits of cheap space transportation? 
Well, if we had a single stage to orbit vehicle, perhaps like the Delta Clipper or something, fully reusable SST, <coughs> um, and it used methane oxygen propulsion, you'd want to use that because methane is orders of magnitude cheaper than hydrogen. Okay? You couldn't get these costs if you're using hydrogen, it was like $4 a kilogram. Okay? You want to use something that's pennies a kilogram as propellant if you want to get cheap transportation. Uh, and you run the numbers. Uh, and you can calculate that it would take around $14 a kilogram uh, worth of fuel costs to send something to orbit and back. Uh, and then if you say that the total transportation system cost is seven times propellant cost, which is about twice what it is with airlines here today, to be a bit more liberal uh, in that respect, because we are doing something more formidable than subsonic uh, airplane flight here. Uh, then uh, what you end up with a cost is, is about a hundred bucks a kilogram to Leo is achievable with rocket propulsion, okay, in the long term. Uh, the, uh, and then if you add on, uh, if you assume that the ship going from Earth to Mars recycles 95% of the water and air uh, and so forth, then you find that each passenger has to go along with 400 kilograms of consumables. And then if you add on another 500 kilograms of capsule mass for every passenger and its consumables, you get around 10,000 kilograms, excuse me, 1,000 kilograms of trans-Mars mass per passenger. And then if you take the multiplier that's required to send 1,000 kilograms trans-Mars, it's several thousand kilograms from low Earth orbit. Um, the, uh, and in fact, so it turns out that for each passenger, you've got to lift around 3,200 kilograms to LEO. And at this launch cost, that would come out to $320,000 a passenger there to Mars. 300,000 bucks. Well, that's pretty expensive. That's not going to support a lot of tourism. Okay? It can support colonization. Okay? If you look at the actual relative cost of colonization in the 1600s, and in well into the 1700s, in fact, in North America, what did it take to come to America? It took a middle class person to completely liquidate his farm and his house to buy a one way ticket here. Okay? And for a working man, it took a commitment to seven years of indentured service. Seven years salary. Year salary equivalent today, perhaps $40,000 times seven, $280,000. It's the same order. Okay? This is the kind of threshold that if somebody wants to emigrate somewhere, are willing to do. Now, it can be brought down. Okay? If we went beyond rockets to scramjets, which is something that's very difficult today, but if we're looking at uh, a, 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 a space faring civilization that is aggressively developing its technology because it's got lots of places to go in space and it wants to reduce costs because it needs to, well, that could reduce the cost by a factor of three. If we close the life support system to 99% instead of 95%, that could cut things by another factor of 0.7. Okay, if instead of using chemical propulsion to escape from Earth, we use electric propulsion, that can cut things another 40%. Uh, if you actually use uh, cyclers with their orbits adjusted by magnetic sails, get another 30% saving. And if you cumulatively add up all these savings, you could cut the cost of a fare to Mars from $300,000 to around $30,000. So, at which point, uh, the floodgates of immigration are wide, wide open. The, uh, now, people sometimes ask, well, look, you know, what's this thing going to export? Okay? Uh, you know, and, and they point to various business plans, which many people are, of course, skeptical of, such as, well, we can develop the moon by exporting helium-3. Well, maybe. There's obviously a lot of problems in that plan. Fusion reactors don't exist. They may someday. On the other hand, is it really worth it to fuel them with helium-3 as opposed to simply use low activation materials for the reactor wall, et cetera? And even if you did, all you're getting is a helium-3 mine on the moon anyway. Uh, what are you going to export from Mars? Mars doesn't have any helium-3. Okay? There's some things I could name that you could export from Mars in the way of material objects. Uh, but fundamentally, I don't think that the main object of interplanetary commerce, at least from Mars, is going to be material objects. I think it's going to be valuable information. What kind of information? Patents. Because what you have on Mars, what you will have on Mars, is a population of extremely technologically adept people in a frontier environment in which they're being constantly forced to innovate. 
Okay, Mars is going to use greenhouse agriculture. Okay, that means that compared to Earth, acreage is going to be extremely limited. Okay, they're going to want to have super productive crops. The kind of agriculture we have here won't be good enough for that. They're going to be forced to push the envelope. And so if someone comes along with a biotechnology innovation that promises to uh, triple crops, they're not going to let some Jeremy Rifkin character hold them up for 30 years with lawsuits. Won't happen. Okay? What you're going to have forced upon them is frontier pragmatism. Okay? So it's going to be a hotbed of innovation, just as 19th century and 18th century America was, where you had a tremendous labor shortage here, so you, and you had tremendous gadgeteering, and you did not have guild controls over the practices of production because they were free of, of, of those sort of institutional barriers to innovation. And so you had an incredible driver for technological innovation here. I think you'll have the same thing on Mars. And if you do have an inventor's colony on Mars coming up with inventions, whether it's in uh, high productivity agriculture, in robotics, to deal with the labor shortage, to uh, dry, hot, rock geothermal energy production, uh, there's a way of producing energy that can also be used on Earth, that that's the sort of thing uh, that they can export to license those patents on Earth to generate the cash that's required to pay for the small portion of their logistics that will have to be imported. And once again, because Mars is so rich in resources, it has a much smaller percentage of its total needs that would have to be imported. Now, Mars, though, also, as Martian civilization develops, and you have food production capacity developing on Mars, for example, uh, Mars got a tremendous advantage over Earth as a staging base for supporting uh, exploitation of the asteroid belt. There's a bunch of calculations here in the present in my book, but basically speaking, the delta V and the and, and, and requirements to go from Mars to the asteroid belt are much lower than those from Earth, and it leads to orders of magnitude less cost in supplying necessary goods to the asteroid belt from Mars than from Earth. Now, it's still the case that certain things needed in the asteroid belt would probably have to be produced on Earth, certain high technology goods that require a very large division of labor. However, the situation is very similar to that which existed in the colonial period in the relationship between Britain, the North American colonies, and the West Indies. Okay? The West Indies spice plantations and sugar plantations produced a cash crop, but they were not viable civilizations. They couldn't even produce their own food, let alone finished wood. Uh, and and um, you know, they weren't producing an adequate array of crop plants, they weren't producing finished wood, they weren't producing craft goods. They weren't producing clothing in any extent. They weren't producing a whole range of things that could, that was being produced in New England. Uh, now, for their high-tech goods, so to speak, those were still being produced in Britain. But the way it worked was that the American colonists could sell their intermediate technology goods, you might call them, in the West Indies, acquire the sugar, sell it to Britain uh, for uh, for cash to import the required high technology goods to North America. Uh, the, uh, and so it's a kind of a triangle trade. And the same relationship, I think, as Mars civilization develops would hold in terms of Mars supporting the mining of the asteroid belt. Because the asteroids, yeah, they do have rich metals. They're kind of like the West Indies in that respect. They have an identical cash product. But uh, they, they certainly do not have the kind of resources that are needed to support the development of an indigenous civilization as such. So in the same way that uh, the West Indies were supported from uh, North America and the Indonesian spice islands were supported out of Australia, uh, the um, uh, Mars could support the asteroid belt. Now, I mentioned terraforming. And as the population develops on Mars, and as we start getting significant industrial capacity developing on Mars, okay, there will be developing an interest in increasingly practical possibility of actually transforming the planet. Because Mars was once a warm and wet planet, and it could be made so again today. There are vast amounts of carbon dioxide that's been absorbed into the Martian soil. Uh, enough, in fact, that if you could outgas it, you could create an atmosphere on Mars, not 1% as thick as the Earth's today, but around 30% as thick around 5 psi. 5 psi is what we use in Skylab. 5 psi, you don't need a spacesuit. All you need is oxygen breathing gear. Uh, the, um, how do you get it out? You get it out by warming the planet. 
And in fact, we even see this today as Mars is in an elliptical orbit, and when it gets closer to the sun each Martian year, the atmosphere thickens by 25%. And then it goes back into the atmosphere, uh, into the soil when it moves away. Uh, if you can go to Mars and produce greenhouse gases on Mars at the same rate we're producing them on Earth, you can produce a very, very large increase in Mars atmospheric thickness. Because, I guess it's too long to explain some detail here, but the basic idea is you warm the planet, CO2 comes out of the soil. CO2 is also a greenhouse gas, and that amplifies your effort. So the CO2 comes out, it warms the planet still more, and so even more CO2 comes out. And as the planet starts to warm, the vapor pressure of water vapor also increases, and that warms the planet even more because water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. And so if you actually put in a certain uh, temperature rise due to direct greenhouse warming, okay, if you input five degrees of greenhouse warming on Mars in terms of what you yourself are actually doing, you would typically, uh, depending upon what you assume for the nature of the regolith and so forth, produce five to ten times that much actual output warming of the planet due to CO2 <laughs> amplification. Okay? Now how much how much greenhouse gases, how much carbon tetrafluoride uh, in particular would one need to produce on Mars in order to warm the planet? Well, this chart shows it in, in terms of you can warm it to warm it 10 degrees Kelvin yourself, which would then force at least a 50 degree rise in the ambient temperature. Uh, you would have to produce uh, CFCs at a rate of around 900 tons an hour and dump them into the atmosphere. Okay? That's about the same rate we're currently producing them on Earth and putting them in air conditioners and refrigerators and things. But here we wouldn't do that. we just throw them out, dump them out. The amount of power required to do that is fairly large. It's around 5,000 megawatts, uh, which is uh, about twice the power that Chicago uses. So this is a fairly large project. But it's not astro-engineering. We're not, you know, disassembling stars or building Dyson spheres or something like this. What we're talking about here is doing engineering on a pretty significant scale, but on a scale well below that which humanity is currently using energy on Earth. This is about the amount of energy that Holland uses. We have that kind of power on Mars when we terraform Mars. Okay? That won't happen immediately, but it, it's not really that far off before that becomes a possibility. Then the CO2 would outgas from the soil. And what we're talking about here, by the way, in terms of time scale, to create an atmosphere, say 160 millibar, which would be uh, thick enough that you could breathe it. Well, you couldn't breathe it because it'd be CO2, but you wouldn't need a spacesuit anymore. You're talking about time scales on the order of 60, 70 years uh, for that to uh, occur. So within a little more than half a century of the initiation of serious terraforming operations, you could have a Mars in which the temperature had been raised above the freezing point of water in the tropical region. So you would have liquid water on Mars. You would have rain. You would have plants growing in the open. And you could have cities not made out of tuna can hams or small 100 meter domes that are strong, but kilometer dimension domes because they wouldn't have to be strong because they'd be exterior pressure um, and, and to create broad habitation areas. Now, to transform that atmosphere from a CO2 atmosphere to an oxygen atmosphere, if it was done with plants, uh, including pretty good plants, would take about a millennium. Uh, however, if we're talking now a civilization on Mars a hundred years or so from now, we're talking about people having technological capabilities considerably in excess of what we have here uh, today, and uh, they could potentially accelerate this process considerably. Uh, So that's what Mars can start looking like a few hundred years from now. You're talking about bringing a dead world to life. You're talking about refilling the oceans of Mars. You know, they, the Mars Surveyor spacecraft is orbit around right, Mar right now on Mars has found a region in the Arctic of Mars in which you have topography that is flatter than anything on Earth except for the ocean bottoms. It's clear that Mars once had an ocean. It can have it again. Okay? Uh, and this would be in my opinion, the most noble endeavor that human beings have ever done. Now there's another reason, besides doing our duty to Gaia, why we should do this. Okay, um, 
which is, what is a new world? A new world is a chance for a new start. A hundred years ago, Frederick Jackson Turner, Wisconsin's greatest son, professor at the University of Wisconsin, um, crashed the Ivy League uh, intellectual club uh, with the Turner thesis. Uh, and um, identifying the importance of the open frontier of the development of American society, society based on innovation. Okay? The, uh, you know, since the days of Turner's paper, 1893, the significance of the frontier in American history. Since the days when the fleets of Columbus sailed into the waters of the New World, America has been another name for opportunity, and the people of the United States have taken their tone from the incessant expansion, which has not only been open, but which has ever been forced upon them. Okay, he would be a rash prophet who should assert that the expansive character of American life has now entirely ceased because the frontier closed in 1890. Uh, okay, uh, movement has been its dominant fact, and unless this training has no effect upon a people, the American energy will continually demand a wider field for its exercise. But never again will such gifts of free lands offer themselves for a moment at the frontier. The bonds of custom are broken, and unrestraint is triumphant. There is not tabula rasa. The stubborn American environment is there with its imperious summons to accept its conditions. The inherited ways of doing things are also there. And yet, in spite of the environment, in spite of custom, each frontier did indeed furnish a new opportunity, a gate of escape from the bondage of the past, and freshness and confidence and scorn of older society, impatience of its restraints and its ideas, and indifference to its lessons have accompanied the frontier. Okay? And this has occurred not only in such areas as social custom and technological um, progress, but it's occurred in the thing, of course, which the United States is most, well, certainly in the late 18th century and even today, most noteworthy for around the world, is the home of the noble experiment in which new forms of human social organization deemed impossible by previous established civilizations were implemented and humanity was brought to a higher state of civilization thereby. Okay? In previous societies, who would have thought that you actually can have freedom of religion? It will lead to chaos if people can believe whatever they want. How can you have freedom of the press? It will lead to chaos if people can say whatever they want, etc. and so on. And how can you have trial by jury of the peers? And common people trying themselves get real. Uh, the um, okay. Uh, how can you have them vote? Um, okay. So. By going to a new place where there was a possibility for a new start, a new and higher form of human civilization was introduced into the world the, uh, and set itself as an example for replication around the world. Well, we've gotten this far, but we've got a ways to go. I think, I think that it is possible that human beings offered a chance for a new start on Mars can implement higher forms of law. Okay? We're still ruled by oligarchy here. You vote for representative government. There's no particular reason in this day and age okay, why we couldn't have direct voting with electronic communications being what they are. People should be allowed to govern themselves. Okay? You know, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, additional rights which uh, one could use as the basis for organizing society, which I think that people in this society would view as utopian, and perhaps some of them are. Okay? But I don't think all of them are. And the, uh, if we go to a new place, if we have a chance to make a new start, okay, we have a chance for another noble experiment. And that is what makes Mars really worthwhile. So what do we need to do today? We need to start. Start phase A. We have a unique possibility a unique possibility to get a Humans to Mars program initiated in the spring of 2001. Okay, why? Because we have the first administration of the next millennium coming in. It's going to be a time for new beginnings. And of course it will be the first term of a potential two-term administration, one which can be in office long enough to actually implement you know, an eight-year program required to get humans to Mars, which is sort of a political precondition for this sort of thing. The first spring of a new administration is the time when it has the wind in its sails, when it can initiate great beginnings. And a new millennium? Well, what happened the last time we had a new millennium? Well, let's take a look. For 500 years after Rome fell, 
No one built anything of any real consequence in Western Europe. No one built anything of stone more than two stories tall. People basically thought that the, 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 there was no future. They were being deluged with barbarian invasions and Huns and Vikings and Moors and everything and the threat of supernatural destruction of the world in the year 1000. And then what happened? We rounded the corner on the year 1000 and the threat of supernatural destruction receded and the, the Vikings and the Moors and these other threats had kind of gotten under control and political order was gradually being established in Western Europe and people looked around and they said, we made it. There's going to be a future. And they started building cathedrals, which is a statement of belief in the existence of the future. Well now look, we've just survived the 20th century which has been arguably one of the most dangerous centuries in human history. Okay, we've had two world wars, we had a depression, we had fascism and Nazism and communism, we had a cold war, we had a near nuclear war, and we've gone through it. We've made it. We can look around the world, the year 2000, and if things are like they are now, we've got institutions falling into place in Europe to prevent another general European war. You know, things are moving. Okay, I think people are going to realize that there is going to be a future, and there needs to be a statement made in the existence of the future, and there can be no more powerful statement to that than the establishment of human beings on a new world. So we're going to have that possibility, and we need to take advantage of it. Now, John F. Kennedy, in 1961, was able to get up in front of the American people and said, I am committing us to be on the moon within 10 years. Why? Well, ultimately, because this is America, and America can do anything, and I don't care how much it costs. All right? Okay? There aren't that many politicians with that degree of vision or courage. Okay? Uh, certainly not today. Uh, today, they want to see the numbers before they make an announcement. They want to know it will succeed before they take an announcement. Okay? They won't go out on a limb like that. So, if Indeed, we are going to get a presidential announcement in the spring of 2001. We've got to start organizing for it now. Okay? NASA has to be allowed to spend the money required to do the homework, okay? to design a mission plan in considerable detail, what they call a phase A, okay? and be able to throw the report on the desk of the president-elect in November 2000 and say, here's the plan. These are our detailed cost estimates. We can have people on Mars by 2008, by the end of your second term, the choice is yours. Because if instead you have the new president simply commission NASA to draw up a plan, and they come back in 2003, by then they're in the third year, they're in their sex scandals, they're gone. Okay, uh, you know, it ain't gonna happen. They gotta, they gotta be able, NASA's gotta be free to spend this money now. Congressman Rohrenbacher has gotta get out of the way of NASA spending uh, the money it needs to on the planning uh, and essential uh, technology demonstrations required within the phase they have a humans to Mars program. It's not that much money. All NASA programs are divided into four phases, A, B, C, D, which through a miracle actually happened in that order. Uh, <laughs> a, a is preliminary design where you figure out what you're going to do and basically how much it's going to cost. B is where you actually design it and you find out where every rivet goes. C is your building, D is your flight. The phase A of a NASA program typically involves around 1% of the program cost, but around 25% of the program time. If we could get the phase A done between now and the spring of 2001, we'd be in a terrific condition to launch a blitz towards Mars within the first decade of the 21st century. So we need to get organized. Okay? We need to start talking to people in all the political camps that will be gelling around candidates. Uh, in order to educate them, to predispose them towards making such a decision uh, in the initial phase of, of, of their office. Um, you know, right now, Golden, as people at headquarters, are suppressing studies that have been done at Johnson Space Center where they have adopted a derivative of the Mars Direct Plan, a semi-direct approach, okay? And they have um, shown, okay, that using a rather expanded version of the Mars Direct mission that we can have humans to Mars uh, within 12 years or so for roughly $50 billion. Now, I think that could be cut in half. I think if, if they thin that thing down, it could be cut in half, and they could do it for 20 to 30. But that's not the point. Whether it's 30 or whether it's 50, it's tens of billions, not hundreds of billions. Okay? If that information were out, we'd destroy the $400 billion myth that has been a fatal impediment to getting a human Mars program out of the box. Al Gore doesn't want to hear about that. 
okay, um, because they're trying to, to prevent there being such a program or the, 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 the uh, but we have, we have to free things up. We've got to organize. And that's one of the reasons why we're forming a Mars Society this August. If you haven't seen the flyer, it's in your packet. If you don't have a packet, I've got extra copies up here. Uh, Founding convention is going to be in August uh, 13th through 16th in Boulder, uh, Colorado, uh, this year. Um, and so we're going to put the heat on politically. We're also going to initiate some projects to attempt to initiate Mars exploration on a private basis. Uh, the taking the Jacques Cousteau approach. Okay, you start with an initial project that you can afford. Maybe raise a few million dollars to fly a hitchhiker payload to Mars on a NASA Mars mission, a balloon with a photographic gondola. You use the credibility you get from doing something real to raise a lot more money, say fly, or raise a hundred million at that point, fly a full-up robotic mission to Mars. Okay, the, uh, and then if you did that, I mean, think of what would happen if a private organization had done Pathfinder. Okay, they got 700 million hits on the Mars Pathfinder website since Pathfinder landed. 100 million on the day it landed. That's more than the number of people who vote in the United States. Okay? That's how many people came out to be part of that. Okay? There are more people in this country interested in Mars exploration than are interested in voting. The, um, that's true. And certainly vastly more than are interested or supporters for or against than any of the fetish issues currently dominating American politics, be it gun control, abortions, and this, that, and the other one. Okay? The, uh, because Americans, in their heart, know that we're people of the frontier, that we got here because of uh, ancestors and predecessors okay, who had the guts to go and put it on the line to be as impractical as to leave settled environments and go take a chance in a new world. And everything we have, we owe to them. And that if we do not do this, we be risk becoming less than the people who got us to where we are today. And that is something we cannot afford. That is the one thing we cannot afford. Okay? To become less than what we were. Okay? And, um, and that is why we can mobilize the political support. And if we can't mobilize the political support, that is why I think ultimately we can mobilize private dollars to do this, provide we incrementally build up the credibility. Okay? Because people will support this if they think that the people who they would be giving to are actually really doing it. Okay? But one way or another, we're going to have to make this happen. This will not happen by itself. History is not a spectator sport. History is made by people who believe they can make history. And I'm asking you to help me and others make history on this. So I'm going to conclude. I'm going to conclude with a quote. It's a quote that I drew from a book called The Plymouth Plantation. Okay? This uh, is a book that was written by William Bradford, who was the leader of the Pilgrims. And he wrote this book uh, one year after the Mayflower landing in uh, Plymouth. He wrote it in 1621. And what he's talking about here is the debate that erupted among the Pilgrims when they were in Holland. And uh, they didn't like what was happening to them there, and they didn't know what to do about it. And what happened was one guy came up with a totally bizarre suggestion of what they ought to do about it, was relocate the entire congregation from the civilized Netherlands into the wilds of North America. Okay? Because there, as, as difficult as it might be, there they could cut their own path. There they could make their own world. And, and, and he says the following. He says, this proposition, relocation to America, being made public and coming to the scanning of all, it raised many variable opinions amongst men and caused many fears and doubts amongst themselves. Some, from their reasons and hopes conceived, labor to stir up and encourage the rest to undertake and prosecute the same. Others, again, out of their fears, objected against it and sought to divert from it, alleging many things and those neither unreasonable nor improbable, as that it was a great design and subject to many unconceivable perils and dangers. It was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprise and overcome with answerable courages. And I put that up there because it's got to be understood that that and nothing less than that was the kind of sheer moxie that it took to establish human civilization, European civilization rather, in North America. And that and nothing less than that is going to be what is required to establish human civilization on Mars. Okay? Because, you know, look, I just showed you this plan, the Mars Direct Plan and its follow-ons, and uh, taking the Mars Direct Plan most particularly, 
It's by far the cheapest Mars mission plan that anyone has ever seriously proposed. It is also, in my opinion, by far the safest. It is the safest because the relatively small vessels can be completely integrated on the ground at the Cape, where you have much greater quality control than you ever could have in orbital construction of giant spacecraft by a few astronauts. And because you have completely redundant Earth return systems, and because you have the capability of making essential consumables on the surface of Mars, um, and for many other reasons. It's the safest plan there is. But it is still risky, and it's incredibly risky. Okay? And it's going to be incredibly risky when people go to Mars the first time, and that is going to be true. Whether we do it my way in 2007, or whether we completely abdicate our historical responsibility and leave it to some other far future civilization to do it in 3007. But if you look at human history, and I don't care when you look, whether you're talking about 1621, or 1944, or 1969, or any other time, there's one thing is perfectly clear, and that is that nothing great has ever been accomplished without courage. Thank you for your attention. Well, your idea about proposing to the president-elect from our director, I'd, I'd love to see that happen, I'd love to see him accept it, but given the outrageous cost overruns and schedule slips of the space station and the space shuttle, and for that matter, the power was way over budget, why should they believe anything NASA tells them about the cost of schedule estimate? Because there's NASA and there's NASA, there's different people at NASA, and there's different groups at NASA. Okay, the space station was not conceived of as a product-oriented program. It was conceived as a process-oriented program, which is, say, a program designed to provide work for people and keep them busy. Okay, so it was designed to be very complex and take a long period of time. And the one time that NASA tried to break out of that mold, in the general review that was done in 1993, where they came up with options A, B, and C, options A and B were a bunch of ticky-tacky modules thrown together in space on a truss, uh, option C was build a Skylab-type space station and launch it in the afternoon with a shuttle C. Option C was universally and forcefully approved by the MIT Blue Ribbon Review Panel as the correct way to go, which was, it improved their acuteness and only proved their sanity. It was obviously the correct way to go. They were overruled by Al Gore and George Brown, who wanted to have a lot of ticky-tacky modules that could be strung together so the Europeans could give one, the Japanese could give one, the Russians could give one, and we could have this big international thing in space. Okay, so uh, the space station program has essentially been sabotaged by these political hacks and uh, who, who have basically prevented NASA from implementing a competent design. And that is the reason for the overruns. It's not because some hapless middle manager at Johnson Space Center somewhere is, is, is misspending the money. It's because they've been stuck with a totally flaky design. Now, if you approach this project from the point of view of getting it done, and you let them design it, and you put deadlines on it, which is also very important, because there is dead weight in NASA, of course, but the way you shake out the, de the dead weight is with deadlines. Okay? I mean, the, uh, the, you know, the, I mean, look, you know, the NASA, to a certain extent right now, is like a peacetime army. Okay? With, you know, not everybody is good. There's a lot of parade ground officers in there. How do you get rid of parade ground officers? You throw them into war, and you sift them out. And after you know some disasters, you get rid of your McClellans and you bring in your grants. As you find out who can do it and who can't. Okay? The uh, well, that's what we got to do. The best way you could reform NASA is by forcing them to have humans on Mars within eight years. Then you'll then you'll get rid of the deadwood real fast. You mentioned well, if we don't do it now, maybe it'll be three thousand seven or something. There's a distinct possibility if we don't do it now, it will never happen. History is littered with civilizations that had the ability to do something great and didn't do it, or there's times when civilization goes backwards. And we have the ability to do it now, we may never have it yet. We don't know what it is. Well, that's precisely the point. That's why I said 3007 as opposed to, say, 2028. Okay? Because civilizations do indeed get their time on the stage, and that time doesn't last forever. They, you know, it's like Shakespeare says, we all have our time on the stage, and you get a chance to say your lines, and, you know, we need to take one tragic example we recently saw was uh, Newt Gingrich, a space advocate who added time and power. Okay, he thought that time would last forever. In fact, it only lasted for the first six months of 1995. He could have done great stuff, and instead he decided to, to waste it being a political hack. Okay, similarly, the United States right now, we have never, no one has ever had a better chance to launch the colonization of solar system in the United States does right now, 
We have an incredibly powerful economy. We have a budgetary surplus. We have no military opponent in the world. None. Okay? We are a superpower without opponents. We are filled with energy, and yet, okay, we have all these technological capabilities that we created due to 50 years of struggle in World War II and the Cold War. Vast technical R&D capabilities that were trillions of dollars worth that, that were created. Not only NASA, but the national labs and within the aerospace companies and the universities. Vast arrays of capabilities that are fading. Okay, they are fading. Let me tell you something. The, 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 the centers of technological excellence in places like Los Alamos and Livermore right now are, 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 are being destroyed because while there's no need you know, for people who understand things like thermonuclear reactions and so forth and so on, nuclear engineering departments around the country are being shut down. Okay? This is what happens in the evolution of civilizations. It is challenged that stresses civilizations and forces them to grow. And when they cease to be challenged, they decay. Okay, and they lose those capabilities. Well, right now, we are sitting with all these capabilities that we developed to achieve this victory. But now that victory has been achieved, okay, the sword needs to be beaten into a plowshare, okay, to allow us to settle a new world. If it is not, it will simply rust away. And, you know, you can read books on this, The Evolution of Civilizations by Carol Quigley. Any number of people have written on this, okay? The, uh, if we don't seize the time, who knows what the future will begin, you know? We won't have this situation of flush prosperity and peacetime and no international challenge forever. We won't. My guess is we won't have it for more than a decade or two, at most. Uh, the, uh, and we might not even have it for that. The economy cycle, things happen. We must seize the time. Take one more question, and apparently I'm out of time. Um, sir, this is a question just about publicity. I don't know if you're familiar with the Art Bell radio show. He has some people that are on the edge, he's got other doctors and stuff like that. But he also has legitimate scientists from time to time. He's had Gene Myers from the Islands One concept. He's had uh, Alan Hale from Hale Bob and some other, some other legitimate folks. I think your plan here would be perfect for this type of listening audience, which is in late night. Well, I'd be happy to get it on the show if I could. Uh, I've been on other radio shows and TV shows, and, uh, and um, you know, if anybody knows a way to, to get to him, I appreciate that. Well, look, I'm going to have to wind it up. If you want to know more, i still got six books left, but the 60 I brought here. Uh, and otherwise, thanks for listening.